In this segment, we'll introduce and discuss metric spaces. We'll begin with the definition of a metric space, then consider a bunch of examples, including a discrete space, Euclidean space, other metrizations of Rn, the spaces of bounded real functions and bounded real sequences, and we'll finish up by considering open and closed sets in an arbitrary metric space. So here's the definition. A metric space is a non-empty set x and a function d that we'll call a metric or a distance function. And this function satisfies three properties. The distance between two points x and y is zero if and only if they are the same element of x. The distance between x and y is equal to the distance between y and x. And the distance between x and y is less than or equal to the sum of the distances between x and z and z and y. And this is true for any three elements x, y, and z in the set x. And we'll refer to the elements of x as points, d as a metric or distance function, and the third condition as the triangle inequality. Now you should verify that these three conditions imply that the distance function can never be negative. Here's an example of a metric space. Let x be any set and let the distance between any two points in x be equal to 0 if they are the same point and 1 otherwise. Then this is a metric space. You can verify that it satisfies all the conditions necessary. It's called a discrete space and d is referred to as the discrete metric on x. As another example, consider Euclidean space, Rn. This is the set of n-tuples drawn from the real numbers, and the metric is the Euclidean distance as shown on the slide. And if n equals 1, this distance is simply the distance between the two points on the real line. Now, aside from Euclidean distance, we can have other metrizations of Rn. For example, if we replace 2 with p in the definition of Euclidean distance, and p is any number greater than or equal to 1, we get an alternative metrization of Rn which we can call dp. And if we take the extreme case where p is infinity, we get the soup metric under which the distance between two points x and y in Rn is just the maximum component-wise distance between these two points. Now you can verify that dp is in fact a metric for Rn by direct application of Minkowski's inequality, which is shown in the slide here. And here you just replace ai with xi minus zi, replace bi with zi minus yi, and you immediately see that the triangle inequality is satisfied and dp is a metric for Rn. We'll deal with the case of d infinity or the soup metric later. Now consider the set of bounded real functions. So let x be any set and let b of x be the set of functions where the codomain is the set of real numbers. And we'll consider bounded real functions so the image of x under the function should be a bounded set of real numbers. And by the completeness axiom we know that this set must have a supremum. And we can define a metric d infinity or the soup metric for the set of bounded real functions as follows. The distance between two functions f and g is just the supremum of the pointwise distances between the images f of x and g of x as x varies across the domain. Now to show that this is in fact a metric for the set of bounded real sequences, we need to show that it satisfies the triangle inequality. And we can do it as follows. So consider any three functions f, g, and h that are all bounded real functions. And let's consider any point x in the domain. Now since x is fixed, we must have the inequality shown on the slide. This is just the triangle inequality applied to real numbers. The distance between f of x and g of x, which are real numbers, must be less than or equal to the sum of the distances between f of x and h of x and h of x and g of x. Now if you recall the definition of the soup metric, the distance between the functions f and h is the supremum of the pointwise distances. And so the right-hand side must be less than or equal to the sum of the distance between f and h and the distance between h and g. Now this is true for all points x, and so therefore it must be true for the supremum of the set of distances between f of x and g of x as x varies across the domain. Now this is not an entirely trivial point, so you should convince yourself that this is true. And it implies that the triangle inequality holds for the soup metric. So we have shown that the set of bounded real functions endowed with the soup metric is in fact a metric space. Next consider the set of bounded real sequences. So these are sequences of real numbers where the terms in the sequence form a bounded set of real numbers. And we can apply the soup metric again in this case where the distance between two sequences xn and yn is the supremum of the set of point by point distances. Now to verify that this is in fact a metric for the set of bounded real sequences just recall that a sequence can be viewed as a function from the set of natural numbers to the set of real numbers. And so a bounded real sequence is just a special case of a bounded real function. 
And so our earlier result immediately implies that d infinity is a metric for the set of bounded real sequences. Now we can also view any point in our n as a function with domain being the first n natural numbers, which immediately implies that the soup metric is also a metric for our n. Next we'll define neighborhoods. So consider any metric space and any point x in this space. For any epsilon positive, we define the epsilon neighborhood of x as the set of points y whose distance from x is less than epsilon. And the epsilon neighborhood around x is also called the open ball centered on x with radius epsilon. And note that the definition of the neighborhood depends both on the set x and on the distance function d. If we change any one of these things, it will change the properties of this neighborhood. Next consider open and closed sets. So consider any metric space xd and any point p in x and any subset e of x. We say that p is a limit point of e if every neighborhood of p contains a point q other than p such that q is an element of e. Now note that p need not be an element of e in order for it to be a limit point of e. We say that e is a closed set if it contains all its limit points. We say that p is an interior point of e if there is a neighborhood of p that is fully contained in e. And we say that e is open if all its elements are interior points. Next we'll show that neighborhoods are in fact open sets. So consider any point x in a metric space and consider any point y in the epsilon neighborhood of x. Define delta as epsilon minus the distance between x and y. And this must be a strictly positive number since y is in the epsilon neighborhood of x. Now you can use the triangle inequality to verify that the delta neighborhood of y is fully contained in the epsilon neighborhood of x. And this immediately implies that y is an interior point of the epsilon neighborhood of x. And since this is true for every y, it must be the case that every element in the epsilon neighborhood of x is an interior point, and therefore the epsilon neighborhood of x is an open set. Now a set can be open, it can be closed, it could be both open and closed, or it could be neither open nor closed. And which of these is the case in any given example will depend not only on the set, but on the metric space within which it's been considered. And you should go through the examples on this slide and determine for each set whether it's open or closed or neither or both. And you'll see that the metric space within which the set is being considered matters. So you'll see that the set of natural numbers has very different properties when viewed as a subset of the real numbers than it does when viewed as a subset of the integers. To finish up, let's define the complement of a set E as the set of points P in X that are not in E, and we'll show that a set is open if and only if its complement is closed. First, let's show that if the complement EC is closed, then E must be open. So suppose EC is closed and consider any point X in E. Now since X is in E, it's not in EC, and since EC is closed and must contain all its limit points, X can't be a limit point of EC. So therefore there exists some epsilon neighborhood of X that is fully contained in E. In other words, X is an interior point of E, and since this is true for any point X in E, E is in fact open. And to finish up, let's show that if E is open, then its complement must be closed. So suppose E is open, and consider any limit point X of EC. Then every neighborhood of X contains a point of EC, since X is a limit point of EC. So X can't be an interior point of E, and so X can't be an element of E, since E is open and all its elements must be interior points. And since X is not in E, it must be in the complement of E. And since this is true of any limit point X of EC, EC contains all its limit points and EC is therefore closed. So we've shown that a set is open if and only if its complement is closed. And that's it for this segment.